Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so I hurried the first part. And then I saw my brothers and sisters. I was so happy to come. So let me tell you why. There is a sweet anointing in the sanctuary. There is a stillness in the atmosphere. Oh, come lay down the burden you have carried for in the sanctuary. God is here. First part, there is a sweet anointing in the sanctuary welcome there is a stillness in the atmosphere you're welcome oh come lay down the burden you you have carried for in this sanctuary God is here he's here he is here welcome to first part he is here to break the yoke and lift the heavy burden he is here he is here oh yes he is to heal the hopeless heart and bless the broken oh come lay down burden you you have carried for in this sanctuary god is here God is here. Welcome to First Park Baptist Church. Our scripture this morning will be taken from Psalm 118. But there is some good news. The grave is empty. Christ lives today. On this resurrected morning, our scripture will be read from Psalm 18, 118, a hymn sung by our Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples after the Lord's Supper. Before they went into the Mount of Olives, Christ Jesus applied this psalm to himself. Beginning with eight, the 19th verse, he said, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. What gate? He said, I am the way, truth, and the life. 21st verse, I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. And I like this part here, he says of himself, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
That was the Lord's doing. The chief cornerstone, the one who holds the spiritual church up. But this is the part right here that we often say in our worship, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But Christ is saying, this is the day of resurrection. This is the day, the Lord's day. He is risen. This is the Christian Sabbath. This is the first day of the week, the most remarkable day in history. A day of resurrection hope, a whole new era of rejoicing, celebrated all over the world. This is the day he is risen, the highest celebration of the year. He rose from the grave to victory in Christ over sin and death. He rose on this day. Hallelujah. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Because I live, you shall live also. He is risen. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I did things as a child. I celebrated Easter eggs and Easter bunnies and parades. But this is the day of his resurrection. Amen. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He died on the cross for our redemption and he rose for our deliverance. He is risen. Let us rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Now the presence of the Lord is being felt. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who has already been, already come, already preparing us. We pray, God, that you will restore us. We pray, God, that you will redeem us. We pray, God, that you will lift us up, reprove us. We pray, God, that you will fill us, anoint us. We pray, God, that we will Feel the joy of your good. We have the joy of your gladness in our hearts as we sing praises to you. We thank you, Lord, for this day, the day that you have made, the day that you rose from the grave, the day that you redeemed us from sin and death, the day that you delivered us. We come to thank you this morning. We come to honor you. We come to praise you. We come to lift up your name. He is risen. He is not dead. In Jesus' name, we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Our announcements this morning. We have our deepest condolences to Sister Claudia Carey and the Carey family. Our brother, Robert Carey, has transitioned from this life to glory. The home coin service will be held here at First Park on Saturday, April 23rd. Service will begin at 10 a.m. Please keep Sister Claudia and the family in prayer. Fish and Loaves Ministry, new coordinator needed as soon as possible. See Angela King. Ushers needed. Please see Gertrude Lawson for more information. Trustee meeting, April 18th, 7 p.m. via Zoom. Fish and Loaves Ministry, April 23rd, 3 to 5 p.m. Meals to go. Gilly prayer at 6 p.m. Join us. Accept holidays, dial 848 722 720 Excess code 152388848 hash mark. Come join us in our Bible study on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Choir rehearsal every Friday, 12 to 1 p.m. Every Saturday, 12 to 2 p.m. 
Future Church will rehearse every second Saturday at noon, unless otherwise stated. All young people from the ages of five to 17 are welcome to join. You got a praise report, prayer request, something to celebrate? Don't keep it to yourself. We would like to pray with you and rejoice with you. Email our church office. Are there any visitors this morning? If you are a visitor, will you please stand and tell us your name and uh, who you are? I mean, where you're from? And if you have, if you're affiliated with the church, you can share that with us as well. Any visitors this morning? Okay, at this moment, I see, I, I, I'm one here, I mean, I'm four one here. Before, I said, my dear, Carolyn Wilbon is here today. We're gonna ask Deacon Wilbon. I asked her if she would like to share a praise report with us. Her husband, Deacon Wilbon, will go over. Good morning, church. Um, I just want to say, first of all, I want to say Jesus is risen. And he's alive and well here at First Park Baptist Church. I want everybody to know, I want first, I want to thank everybody for the phone calls, the cards, the visits. And it just overwhelmed my heart with love. This is my church home. This is my church family. And without your prayers, I, I don't think I could have made it. But I felt your prayers. And I want you to know that I'm sitting here today because I know that Christ is risen. And the things that He's, he's fights my battles for me. I don't have to fight no battles. He fights my battles for me. Every battle, every trial that I've had, it, it's not what I thought it was going to be like. Because he already won the victory for me. So no matter, and I still have some battles to go through. We all have battles. We all have battles to go through. But one of the most important scriptures that I learned was that if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not toward your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So I just want to say I'm grateful and I'm thankful for my husband because it's been a battle for him too. And my daughter, just our little family. It's been a, been a battle, but we have the victory in Christ. And I just want you to know that you have the victory also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Happy wives, happy life, right, Deep? Thank you, Carol Wilbon. We really miss you. It's been over, over a year, over two years. But God bless you. We've been praying for you. Also, we want to make note of this. Uh, Sister Le Vicky LaVon Mitchell called, and she's under the weather today. Keep her in your prayers. Also, our church mother, Muriel Carter. Um, she's in the JFK Harwich, Cedarbrook. Uh, Reverend, I mean, Reverend Florence Peterson, Mother Nero Knott, and Reverend Alice Mears. If that's one I miss, I apologize, but these are our, our seniors that we need to keep in prayer. All right, we have 
entered into his gates with thanksgiving. We have entered into his courts with singing and scripture and prayer. And now we will be blessed this morning and help them as they come before you, our choir, with the minister of music, Brother Mario Williams. Worship time, amen. Grace and peace be unto you, church, from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. Come on, church. He has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Alleluia. What a privilege and an honor to be in the Lord's presence this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm super glad to be in the house. It's good to be seen. Amen. Amen. She has risen. Hallelujah. When I saw Sister Carol in the parking lot, I wanted to just shout right there. You don't know what it's like to be home and alone and going through some things, amen? But God is so worthy. Is he worthy, church? Is he worthy, church? Come on, give yourself a hug this morning. Love on yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good. He is so worthy of all the praise oh come magnify him jesus is his name this song is so simple but it's so true he is so worthy of all the praise oh come magnify him Jesus is his name. Come on, choir. Sing with me. He is so worthy. He is so worthy of all the praise. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is his name. I think you got it. Could you sing with us? He's so worthy. He is so worthy of all the praise. Of all the oh come oh magnify magnify what's his name Jesus is his name one more time he is so worthy he is so worthy of all all the praise oh come magnify him Jesus is his name. They still learning it, so let's help them out again. He is so worthy. He is so worthy of all, all the praise. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is his name. The next part says honor. Honor and glory belongs to him. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is his name. Honor and glory. Honor and glory belongs to him. Oh, come please magnify him. Jesus is his name. Is he so worthy? He is. He is so worthy of all the praise. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is his name. Honor and glory. Honor and glory belong to him oh come magnify him jesus is his name he is so worthy he is so worthy of all all the 
praise. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is like on his name. Honor and glory. Honor and glory belongs to him. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is his name. Magnify him. Jesus is his name. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is his name. Oh, oh, come magnify him. Jesus is. Last time, church single. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus is. If you on Facebook, share this. Oh, come magnify him. Jesus. Take your family to come real quick. Oh, oh, come. Magnify him, Jesus is his name. Hallelujah. Oh, come magnify him. Why? Because Jesus is his name. Who is that Jesus that you speak of? He was sent down from glory. Many things he was on earth. A holy king, a carpenter, the living word. Somebody say, you are the living word. Somebody say, you are the living word. Say, you are the living word. That's who he is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Where the sin down from glory.
You are the living word. You are the living word. You're my rose of sharing. You are the living word. You're the bread of life. You are the living word. You're my very best friend. You are the living word. You're the leader of my soul. You are the living word. You are the love of my life. You are the living word. You are the living word, Father. You are the living word. Hallelujah. We praise you. Don't stop worshiping. Don't stop praising them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Crucified, laid behind a stone. You live to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all, above all power. Above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, man. you were here before the world began. You were crucified, laid behind a stone. You lived to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all you were crucified laid behind the stone you lived to die rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all. Yes, Lord, you are crucified, laid behind the storm, you live to die, rejected and You took the fall and thought of me. You took the fall. Say it to yourself. And thought of me. You took the fall and thought of me. When all else failed, you took the fall, Jesus. And thought of me. That's the joy right there. He took the fall. Took the fall and thought of me. Church, you are worth it. You are destined. You took. 
took the fall and thought of me. He knows every hair on your head, right? So no matter what you've ever been through, you took the fall. Thank you, Lord, and thought of me. He loved you so much. You took the fall and thought of me. Above all. Hallelujah. He took the fall for us, church. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. Hallelujah. He took the fall and thought of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. He was crucified, laid behind the tomb, thought of us above all things. He rose up with all power. Is that somebody you need? Is that somebody we need? You're all I need, come on. You're all I need. Every breath you breathe through me. You're all I need, Lord. Let your rivers flow through me. You're all I need. You're all I need. Every breath, breath you breathe through me. You're all I need. Let your rivers flow. You're all I need. You're all I need. You're all I need. You're all I need. From the top, you're all I need. Every breath you breathe, you're all I need. Let your rivers flow. You're all I need. Every breath you breathe, you're all I need. Let your Part. He said, he said, if I be lifted, I will draw all men to me. You're my closest friend and you I live, have my being. I want to draw closer. He said, he said, if I be lifted, be li I'll draw, I will draw all men to me. You're my closest friend and you I live. He said, he said, if I be lifted, I will draw all men. You're my closest friend. And you're my closest friend. And you are live. Have my being. I wanna draw closer. Need to draw closer. I wanna draw closer to me, to me. You're all I need. Every breath you breathe. You're all I need. Let your rivers flow. You're all I need. Every breath you breathe, you're all I need. Come on, church. Let your rivers flow. You're all I need. 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 Oh.
Jesus. Can I help myself? child like they're young. I need you. So when they go up, they won't depart. I need you. Out of mouths of bay. You're all I need. Everybody sing. I need you in the balcony. I need you. Sing to the glory of God. Jesus. <laughs> Somebody say glory. Hallelujah. What a fellowship. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. We serve a risen Savior. We need him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To lay down his life. Amen. And then get up with all power. At this time, we're going to ask everyone to stand. We're going to sing our congregational hymn. Hallelujah. My husband likes the technology. That's right. Hallelujah. Was free for 
see there was grace and grace was free. Pardon, there was liberty to me. There my mercy burdened so I found at Calvary. See, there was great and grace was free. Hallelujah. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. That's right. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Now we have the ministry of prayer. You can, Freddie Wilbur. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday to all. It is truly prayer time. I want to lift up prayers for the Carey family who's experienced a death. And also, I received a call this week that from Marvin. Uh, he is back in the rehabilitation center. He's still experiencing problems. He hasn't rejected the kidney, but he's still having problems with the medication to keep him from rejecting the kidney. So he checked himself back into the rehabilitation center. So we want to keep Brother Marvin in prayer. As Larry mentioned earlier, we have a lot of sick and shut in. We want to pray for LaVon Mitchell this morning, uh, who's not feeling well. We also want to pray for Reverend Mears. Uh, did she get home, Priscilla, or is she still in the hospital? We want to. Okay, we pray that she do get discharged. I talked to her on Thursday or Friday or whatever, and she was looking forward to coming home. So we pray that. Uh, her healing continues, and she's able to come home from the hospital. We also want to lift up Reverend Peterson. Um, talk to her this week as well, and uh, she's in good spirits. She says she get a little lonely sometimes being home uh, by herself, but she's in good spirits. She's still trusting the Lord, and so we just pray that she continues to Trust in him and everything will be okay. God's will will be done in her life. Uh, we also want to pray for uh, Miriam Cardi, as Larry mentioned. We talked about it in our deacons meeting that we don't pray enough for our sick and shut-ins. So we do want to pray for them. Uh, Muriel is our church mother, as some of you may know. And I also want to pray for my brother. I seen him walk in this morning. Brother Justin is here this morning. We pray for Bela and the boys as well. We, we miss y'all. We want you to know we miss you and we think that you saw your way to come this morning and be with us in the service. So we pray for your whole family and your well-being. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mother Knotts, uh, where is Luana? We want to keep your mother in prayer as well. We want to pray for her. That's another one out, sick and shut-ins. So we want to pray for her. Uh, I don't believe um, if I missed anybody, you know it's in my heart to pray for you. Not my mind, but it's in my heart. So we pray that you forgive me if I overlooked anybody. Uh, I see uh, Sister Renee. How are you doing this morning? 
praying for you and your upcoming nuptials, nuptials, however you say that word, whatever it is. You, we pray for your marriage, your upcoming marriage. And I'll just, I, I, I'll, I'll keep it simple. I'll keep it simple. So it's good to see you this morning. I'm sure your mother is happy. She got both of her children with her this morning. So we, we pray for you as well. Uh, let us go to the throne. Most gracious Heavenly Father, give you thanks and praise. We ask your blessings upon all of our sick and shut in. We pray this morning we have once again experienced the sting of death, Heavenly Father, in our church family. So we pray for the Carey family. We pray that uh, you will whip them in this time of bereavement and grief, Heavenly Father. We just pray that you would, would do, do some healing in the family. We know that this is a time when everyone is sad and sickened, but they can count on you as their savior to Heavenly Father, that they know that, that you have, have saved their, the, the man of God that you put over that household, Brother Robert Carey. We just pray that you uh, move in the family and give them much uh, relief from their grief. And the Father, we thank you this morning for uh, Mary Ocardia, who is our church mother. We pray for uh, Sister Knott. We pray for Sister Peterson. We pray for uh, Reverend Mears. We just pray for LaVon. We pray for all of our elders this morning, and the Father. For those who are mentioned and not mentioned, we just pray that you would uh, be with them and guide them. And the Father, we thank you for uh, uh, what you're doing in their life. We just want to honor and glory you, glory, give glory to you this morning and our praise and thanks for what you've done. Now. And the Father, we just pray uh, right now for our church family. We just pray that all of the needs that are being met, Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you allowed us to be here this morning to praise you, to thank you, and to lift up your name. And the Father, we just pray that you would just continue to move upon this body then the Father, we just uh, want uh, your will to be done in this church. We pray that you would move upon the hearts of everyone that's, that's in this building right now. I don't know their specific needs, but you do, then the Father. We pray that the needs are being met. And the Father, we just want to thank you. We want to lift you up, and we want to praise you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. He's Amen. worthy to be praised. <laughs> Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, Jesus, blessed Savior, he's worthy to be. to be praised on this resurrection Sunday we give him all the thanks and we give him all the praise because God knows how to give a gift he gave us a wonderful wonderful gift he gave us his son Nothing can surpass that. You know, when God instituted 
things in the church and he didn't institute a church tax. He wanted every gift to be given from one's own free will. Just like the gift that Jesus gave when he gave his life on the cross. When that gift was given, he wanted us to understand and to feel the rewards from giving that gift. And Jesus' reward was that he rose from the dead on the third day. He rose. What greater reward can we ask for that? As it says in Proverbs 18, verse 16, giving a gift can open doors. It gives access to important people. What more of an important person or important thing do you want to have the door open to other than the Lord, other than God? There is nothing greater than that. There's nothing more important than that door that's open. So we invite you today to take a moment with us to usher in this given moment, to usher in the presence of God by giving to him as he has graciously given to you. Will you enter into his presence today? We ask you to go on to our Tithely app to give. Some of you may have already done that. We ask you to mail us a check, 315 West 7th Street here in Plainfield. But yet better yet, we invite you to come into his presence. Come into his presence and give today. We thank you and I remind you all, you spell millions, M-I-L-L-I-O-N-S. Ushers, would you please? One day church, we're gonna have it. One day, I believe that before I leave this earth. Please rise, please stand. Everybody say bless, 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 bless. Everybody, everybody, everybody say bless, 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 bless. Oh, y'all not. Come on. Everybody, everybody say bless, 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 bless. We're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the fields, we're blessed when we come and when we go, we cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must cease, for the devil is defeated, we are blessed, blessed, blessed. Bless, 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 oh, bless. Thank you, Lord, for the suffering. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you glory. We thank you for the gifts that you have presented today. And Father God, we will endeavor and you know it will be spent and used to glorify your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Blessed, bless, 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 yes. I'm blessed, yes, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. 
We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the fields. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty, mercies. Why? For the devil is defeated. We are blessed. Oh, we are. Late in the midnight hour, Bless. God's going to turn it around. Bless. It will work in my favor. Bless. That's my part right there. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. It will work in my favor. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. It will work in your favor. Alex is a witness late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around. It will work in your He's a living, breathing witness, yes. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. In around, in around, yeah, yeah. Said yeah, 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 yeah. Said yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're blessed. <laughs> Amen. We have may, maybe maybe be a surprise to some of you. We're gonna have a presentation. I gotta ask a question. How many of you adults? I don't know the young people. Remember Christmas plays and Easter plays and recitations. I don't hear nobody saying nothing. And you gotta. <laughs> so you remember how you felt when they grown up to look at you? You can do it. You can do it. Sometimes you forget your part. You make up different things. I remember my youngest brother. Uh, they gave out the they gave out the Christmas. Uh, I mean Easter recitations. So he didn't get one. So he came home crying. My mom said, "What's the matter?" I said nobody gave me an Easter recitation. So she said, the lady said, we ran out. So her mother said, don't worry about it. So she gave him one that uh, I always remembered. It was so funny. He was, he was about eight years old. He said, I, okay, I, I went up on the stage. My heart went pit to pat. I thought I heard somebody say, whose little boy is that? <laughs> that was his Easter. That was his Easter uh, recitation. <laughs> And it was so funny because all the kids said, I wish I had a used to presentation like that. That was nice. That was better than mine. But our young people today, we're going to have a presentation. Let's give them a round of applause. Their coordinator would be Sister Valerie Wilbon. Oh, she's up Praise there. The Lord. Praise okay. the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Um, I just wanted to say that this was labor of uh, love and dedication from our youth. Um, they are all very busy people, as it as it uh, turns out. Um, but we wanted to get the um, some of our seasoned youth um, involved in the Easter play. Uh, so we decided to. Um, uh, pull on them, and I just want to say that I'm very proud of uh, the work that we did to pull this off. I hope that you all enjoy, um, and I hope that it ministers to you on this Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. I am Simon Peter. I grew up by the Sea of Galilee and am a fisherman by trade. Fishing is a hard life, but I'm good at it. And I had expected to spend my entire life fishing in the Sea of Galilee. But one day, something happened that changed my life forever. 
I'll never forget that day when my brother Andrew came and told me that he had found the Messiah. We had been looking for the Messiah all our lives, and I could scarcely believe my ears. I went with Andrew to see this Jesus of Nazareth, whom he claimed was the Messiah. I had never met anyone like Jesus before. He was so kind and compassionate, not at all like I expected the Messiah to be. We were looking for someone who could be a political leader, someone who would overthrow Rome. I was ready to help such a person. But as I listened to Jesus speak, I knew he would never lead us in a revolt against anyone. His message was one of love and forgiveness. He spoke of the kingdom of God as within us. I could not understand all that he said or what he meant. I just knew that I had to follow him. As I followed and listened, I saw him do great miracles. He made the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead live again. How could I not believe what he said when I saw him do these marvelous things? And then he took James, John, and me up to a high mountain, and he was transfigured before our very eyes. It was as if we were in the very presence of God himself. What a wonderful experience. I knew he was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. I am Mary Magdalene. For a large part of my life, I was a very troubled woman. I was possessed by seven demons and they controlled my whole being. Do you have any idea what it's like to have no control over what you do or say? I was a prisoner in my own body. There seemed to be no one to help, no one to help me. No one could free me from my prison and no one seemed to care. I was all alone, tortured daily by my condition. And then one day, I heard about a man named Jesus of Nazareth. He was healing people everywhere he went, and multitudes followed him. I decided to go to him and see if he could help me. I had nothing to lose if he couldn't. When I found him, it was almost impossible to get close to him because of the crowd around him. I have never met a man who is so compassionate and kind as Jesus. When he looked at me, I could see the love and concern in his eyes. The demons within me were afraid of this man. They tried to get me to leave, but I could feel the power of Jesus drawing me closer to him. He spoke to the demons, and in an instant, they were gone. And I was free. I can't find words to describe how I felt. It was as if chains had been removed from my body and soul. I felt as free as a bird soaring high above the clouds. After all those years, I was in control of my body and mind. My heart was full of gratitude, and I fell on my knees and worshiped Jesus. Not only was I free from the demons, but I had found a friend, someone who cared about me. No one in my life had ever cared for me like Jesus. Love radiated from him. I've listened as he taught and I became one of his followers, going wherever he went, along with his disciples and some other women. Jesus cared about everyone and ministered to all in need. He taught us about the love of God and showed us how to love those around us. He gave us something no one could ever take away. I accompanied Jesus on his last trip to Jerusalem. His disciples feared for his life and tried to keep him from going, but he was determined he said his time had come, but we didn't know what he meant. The scribes and Pharisees were always trying to find fault with him, and I feared for his life. As the Passover drew near, he made plans to go to Jerusalem. We tried to persuade him not to go, but he was determined. He sent John and me to engage a room and prepare the Passover feast. During supper, he talked about his suffering and that he wouldn't eat again until the kingdom of God came. We didn't understand what he was talking about. He talked about his betrayer being among us, and we were all shocked. Surely none of us would do such a terrible thing as to betray him. After supper, he took a basin of water and a towel and began washing the feet of each of us. When he came to me, I drew back. Imagine 
my Lord washing my feet. But he said, if I didn't have my feet washed, I could have no part of him. He was so mysterious. I just didn't understand. He was trying to teach us to be servants. I told him that I would never leave him, that I would be willing to lay my life down for him. And he said that I would deny that I even knew him three times before the night was over. Who, me? Deny my Lord? Never. After he spoke to us for a while and we sang a hymn, he led us to the garden of Gethsemane. He took James, John, and me farther into the garden, leaving the others behind. And then he left us and told us to watch and pray with him. He went in a little farther and fell on his knees and cried out to God. He begged for God to take away the cup from him, if it were God's will. Never have I seen such agony as he prayed. But the harder I tried to stay awake, the sleepier I became, and I fell asleep. Jesus returned again and woke me, asking me to watch and pray with him. But, he, but sleep overtook me again, and he returned to find me sleeping. I felt so unworthy. I knew I had let him down. Just when he needed me the most, I went to sleep. And then there was a loud commotion, and a multitude of people came, carrying swords and lights. And believe it or not, Judas was leading them. Judas stepped forward and kissed Jesus and said, this is the one. They grabbed Jesus and prepared to take him away. No one was trying to stop them. I couldn't let that happen. I had to do something. So I grabbed my sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. I'll show them, I thought. But Jesus reprimanded me and healed the servant's ear. Jesus didn't try to resist them. It was as if he was giving himself over to them. They led him away to the high priest's house. I followed at a distance. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid. Have you ever been so afraid and confused that you had no idea what to do? That's how I felt. I watched as they mocked him and beat him and questioned him. No matter what they did to him, he showed no resistance. As I watched, three people asked me if I was with him or if I knew him. I was afraid and three times I swore that I did not know him that I had never seen him. And then the rooster crowed and Jesus's words crushed down on me like a ton of rocks. I wish that I could have been covered by rocks or that the mountains would fall on me because I had denied him. I, Peter, who said that I would die for him. I couldn't even be strong enough to admit that I knew him. I was afraid for my life, but what would my life be without him? I was so ashamed that I left and fell on my face and cried loudly. How could he ever forgive me? How could I ever forgive myself? I had deserted him. What good was I? When he needed me the most, I failed him. I left him alone to his face, to face his accusers. I am Pontius Pilate, the Roman procreator of Palestine. I am stuck in this land forsaken by all the gods. When I first arrived here, I enjoyed tormenting the Jews, but to complain so outrageously to Rome that I've had to temper my behavior. I am in Jerusalem to keep order during the Passover feast held by the Jews. It seems like they never tire of these feasts and they always have some kind of uproar going on. From time to time, some hero or another claims to be their Messiah who will overthrow the Roman government. <laughs> That's a laugh. No one will ever overthrow Rome. And then early in the morning, a group of their religious leaders brought this person called Jesus of Nazareth. They wanted me to judge him. When I told them to try him according to their law, they reminded me that it was not legal for them to put any man to death. They can be so proper at times. They accused him of trying to become king. I questioned him by asking him if he were king. He replied, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants, then not my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence? I asked him if he were king and he answered, you say that I am king? 
to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. I could find no fault in him. He seemed to possess a certain quality and power I could not explain. As far as I was concerned, he was as innocent, he was he was innocent of doing any wrong. I told the Jews this and offered to release him. It was the custom to release a criminal at the time of Passover, but the Jews refused Jesus and asked for Barabbas, a known robber, to be released. So we had Jesus beaten, and the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. Then I presented the Jews to him, telling them I found no fault in him. But they cried, crucify him, crucify him. According to our law, he must die because he has called himself the son of God. I was terrified by this. Suppose this man was the son of God. He might strike me dead. I went back in and asked Jesus who he was, but he would not answer me. I told him that I had the power to release him or crucify him. And he replied, you could have no power at all against me unless it would had been given to you from above. I pleaded with the Jews to let me release him because I found no fault in him. And they said I was no friend of Caesar if I just let Jesus go. That did it. I would not be accused of being disloyal to Caesar. I asked for a basin of water and I washed my hands of the whole affair, telling the Jews that this man's blood would not be on my hands. They were more than willing to take the responsibility for his death. I handed Jesus off over to them and then they led him away to be crucified. They took him to Pilate for trial. Pilate said he found no fault with Jesus and wanted to release him. But the crowd cried for Jesus' death. Pilate had him beaten and a crown of thorns placed on Jesus' head and again asked if he could release Jesus. But the mob cried, Crucify him and give us Barabbas. Crucify him, crucify him. Imagine asking for a criminal like Barbaris to be released instead of my loving Lord. What wrong had Jesus ever done? Absolutely nothing. But the scribes and Pharisees had the mob so worked up that they didn't know what they were saying. The mob just repeated the words of the scribes and Pharisees. Crucify him, crucify him. I watched as they led him away toward Golgotha. He stumbled under the load of the cross he carried. But when I looked into his eyes, I knew that he was carrying much more than a wooden cross. My heart ached for him, but what could I do? I am a Roman soldier, an officer in Caesar's army. I am in charge of 100 men, and I was serving in Judea when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. What a place to be. The Israelites despised us Romans, and we had little love for them. There was always some kind of uprising going. Judea was a far cry from Rome with all its dander and gaiety. Judea was a very troubled place, not the ideal spot to be stationed. But as a soldier, I went where I was sent and obeyed the orders handed to me. I had one, uh, one allegiance and that was to Caesar. Almost everyone in and around Judea had heard of this Jesus of Nazareth. He was a great teacher and healer, so they said. But the religious le leaders of Jerusalem were afraid of him, but they brought him to Pilate to be tried. Pilate found no fault with him. Pilate wanted to release him, but the people were loudly crying for his crucifixion. A mob had gathered outside of Pilate's palace and the mob was in a state of frenzy. It would have taken an army to quiet them down. I think Pilate was afraid of the power of Jesus but more afraid of being accused of being disloyal to Caesar. Pilate finally let the people have their way, and after having Jesus scourged, sent him off to be crucified. I was in charge of the crucifixion. I heard he had been arrested and was going to be crucified. Why? What had Jesus done to deserve such a terrible sentence? He had never done anything but good. Why was this happening to someone so full of love and kindness? This was my Lord. How could something so awful be happening? I followed the crowd to the hill outside of Jerusalem 
and hear the jeers and angry shouts. I watched as the Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross, and I flinched each time the hammer struck. I watched as they raised the cross into the air and dropped it into the hole. His whole body jerked, and he groaned with pain. I felt sick to my stomach, and my body was covered with a cold sweat. But I couldn't leave. I couldn't desert my Lord now. My mind kept crying out, why, why, why? What has he done? That is my savior hanging on that cross, suffering such agony. He is so good and kind and gentle and loving. He doesn't deserve this. Why, oh Lord, why? I watched as they nailed him to the cross and placed it between two thieves. He hung there dying. And as he died, my dreams died with him. He was my Lord and Messiah. He told us he would always be with us, but he was dying. I had denied him and forsaken him. I hadn't even had a chance to ask for his forgiveness. And now he was dying and leaving me alone, alone. What would I do without him? How could I go on? Some of the onlookers left, but I couldn't. It was as if I were glued to the spot. It was a terrible, ugly scene but I couldn't make myself leave. I sobbed my way out. I had a sign made to be placed over his head. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The Jews were unhappy with its wording, but I would not change it. I believe he was a king. As a Roman officer, I had seen many crucifixions indeed. I had been in charge of many. Crucifixion was a cruel and ugly death, and I assumed this one would be like all the others. But there was something about this man, Jesus. He was indeed different. He refused the vinegar mixed with gal, which was helped deaden, which was helped to deaden the pangs of suffering. It was as if he had the suffering experience too. He never once complained. Most criminals cursed and yelled, not Jesus. The religious rulers and some of the Roman soldiers mocked him as he hung on the cross. They shouted insults and they insisted that he save himself according to his point. And insisted of become and instead of becoming angry, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Never in all of Rome have I ever witnessed such love and forgiveness. I wondered how someone hanging on a cross could possibly forgive those who tormented and tortured him. And suddenly, about the sixth hour, the sun disappeared, and there was total darkness. What could this mean? Darkness lasted for three hours, and, and finally, Jesus gave a loud moan and died. Then the earth began to shake, and the rocks rumbled and fell. Everyone was terrified, including me. As a soldier, I'm afraid of nothing. But this was entirely different. It was as if the gods had pulled out all the stops and were showing how displeased they were of us. How can anyone fight the gods? And then, as if a great line, light dawned upon me, I realized that this Jesus might have been someone extraordinary. He must be the son of the one true God. Not the gods we worship in Rome, but the Jehovah God that the Israelites talk about and believe in so strongly. I shuddered to think of what kind of punishment this God might send upon us. Like Pilate, I wish that I could have washed my hands of this whole mess. This is one crucifixion that I wish I had no part in. Jesus of Nazareth is no ordinary man. He was the son of God. And then it was over. He was dead. What would happen to me and the other disciples? Would the scribes and Pharisees try to kill us too? It was all over, and they took the body down. I watched as Joseph took the body to his grave and placed it in the tomb. I have never felt so lonely and helpless. There was such a void in my heart. After his death, the Jews came requesting a guard to be placed at the tomb. They were afraid someone would seal his body and claim that he has risen. This man, Jesus, is more than an ordinary man. Although I washed my hands of him, I could not forget him. He plagues my day and night. I allowed a mob to convince me to condemn an innocent man. 
That knowledge is something nothing can wash away. I'll go to my death knowing that I let an innocent man be crucified. After we had observed the Sabbath, some of the other women and I went to the tomb to anoint the body. We talked as we went, wondering how we would be able to move the huge rock in front of the tomb. Imagine our surprise when we saw that the tomb was open and empty. We saw a young man in a white robe sitting in the tomb, and he said to us, do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. It was almost impossible to comprehend what he was saying. How could Jesus be alive? I had seen him die. I had seen him buried. How could he be alive? But the young man insisted that Jesus was risen. He told me to go tell the disciples. So I went and told Peter and John. John and I were together on the first day of the week when Mary Magdalene told us that Jesus was alive. How could this be? I saw him die on the cross, but Mary insisted. Go look for yourself, she said. So John and I ran to the tomb. John got there first and he stopped outside, but I ran on in. Jesus was gone. His grave clothes were lying there. Could it be? Was he really alive? Peter and John returned home. I stood outside of the tomb crying. Again, I looked inside the tomb and saw two angels sitting where Jesus' body had lain. They asked me why I was crying. And I said, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Then I turned around and saw a man standing there. He said to me, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? I thought he was the gardener and I asked him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Then he said to me, Mary? In that instant, I realized that it was Jesus. I fell down and worshiped him. I was so happy to see him. He is alive. I went again and told the disciples that I had seen Jesus and that he is alive. They had trouble believing me, but it's true. He is risen. I still don't know why he chose me to be the first one to see him instead of Peter or John, but I'm so happy. He is such a wonderful friend and he is my savior and Lord. He is risen and he lives today. He is Lord of all. I returned to my home and thought about how I had denied him. If he were alive, what would he say? How could I ever ask for forgiveness? Everything he ever said was true. He knew that I was weak and that I would deny him. How could I live with myself? As I considered all these things, I suddenly was aware of his presence in the room with me. I was dumbfounded. How could this be? I fell to my knees before him. And I knew, I felt his love and power reach out to me and cover me like a blanket. I knew that as unworthy as I was, he had forgiven me and that he loved me. I looked up at him and my heart sang, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive and I'm forgiven and he loves me. Just as he loved me, he loves you and he'll forgive you just as he forgave me. He's alive and he lives forever. Praise God, he's alive. I'm here to tell you that he is risen and that he loves and cares like no one else can. He loved me, he helped me, he cared about me, he saved me. If he did all this for me, someone so unworthy and helpless, you have to know that he loves you and cares about you. Above all, you must believe that he is risen and that he lives today. He is here right now. Don't you feel his presence? He's alive.
All right, let's try it again. Did you enjoy that first part? Yeah. Yes. Um, if, if you have never been a part of a first part play, uh, practice, rehearsals, whatever you want to call it, then you have missed a treat. Our play director, producer, is an amazing human being um, who always keeps the energy right. Yes, Tristan, exactly. Who always keeps the energy right here, regardless of what's going on, regardless of how stressful it is, regardless of the eye rolling or the complaining. Miss Valerie is amazing. And what, yeah. Yes, yes. And what we saw today, uh, <laughs> that, that blew my mind. That was amazing, Miss Valerie. Um, watching the kids grow over the years has been wonderful. Uh, this play practice, we had been through it twice and we figured, all right, this is great. It is time to go. But those kids did not want to leave. They wanted to do it one more time because they weren't satisfied with what they had done. That's growth first part. That's, that's kids wanting to give the Lord their best. And um, it has been a blessing for us, Miss Ruthie, Miss Valerie, and I to be a part of that process. But the kids wanted to do something for Miss Valerie. Uh, so what you see here, Miss Valerie, is a thank you. What you see in this basket is what they wanted you to have. And I'm going to ask, where's Mario? I saw him. I'm going to ask Mario to deliver this to you. This is just, we love you. We appreciate you. And we thank God, not just for what you do for us, but what you do for this whole body of Christ. May God continue to bless you. Let's shout amen for Eric, I mean, for Valerie. Beautiful job, Val. I know we're running close, but I, I just wanted you to uh, tell me, tell us the voices, the, the voices behind those uh, very good speakers. Can you... I recognize uh, many of them, but uh, praise the Lord. Yes. Uh, so Asher, excuse my voice because y'all made me cry yet again. Um, Asher uh, was uh, Simon Peter. Amen. Um, Kayla Dixon was our Mary Magdalene. <laughs> uh, Jaden Brownlee was Pontius Pilate. <laughs> I knew that. Bro. And Jaden Roche was our centurion, the Roman soldier. Woo! And then, um, Mario Jr. and Samora were our our everything, our chorus, our background. <laughs> um, yes. So we just want to say thank you. Um, thank you. I want to say thank you um, to my church family. I'm very proud to be a First Park baby, mm -hmm. born and raised. Um, and like I said, this was a, a labor of love uh, from all of us, from all of the youth to our church family. So we just hope that it ministered to you um, and that you were able to take something away from it. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but the one that the thing that really shook me and I was watching some of y'all when they said crucify him. I seen people like this. Uh, God is saying something to us, right? 
That was you? Amen. <laughs> it's preaching time. I'm not going to read his bio. I'm just going to present him. Powerful preaching man. He's a the Reverend Brian, Dr. Reverend Brian Rawls. He's been with us several times, but we are so elated to have him back again. And so after a selection from our choir, the next voice you will hear is our messenger for the day with a message from the Lord, the Reverend Brian Rawls. Let us say amen. taught the sun where to stand in the morning and who told the ocean you can only come this far and who showed the moon where to hide till evening falling star well I know my redeemer lives I know my redeemer lives let all creation testify The very same God that spins things in orbit runs to the weary, the worn and the weak. But the same gentle hand that holds me when I'm broken they conquer death to bring me victory.
salvation testify life within me cries and I know my redeemer he lives oh he lives yes God oh he praise for Jesus Christ today all over the world the world over they are commemorating and remembering the death of he who lied down in the grave and rose again triumphant even on the third day even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ do you have an extra praise for your Lord and Savior on bright Sunday holy Pascha resurrection morning we give the Lord praise and we honor him with our mouths and our hands and our substance thank God for Jesus today come on let's put our hands together just thank the Lord once again it is so good to be back here at First Park on this wonderful Sunday the Sunday of all Sundays and I do not bore get bored or worn out telling the story over and over again. It is the reason for our existence. And how could I be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ when it is the power, not a power. 
definite article, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. Can we give God praise for this choir, these singers, the musicians? Come on, this is First Park family. Can you give God praise for them? You'll know that when you preach, whenever you, you, you have the opportunity to preach, the atmosphere has to be set and become conducive to receive the word of God. And it's nothing like the Levites who go before and create the atmosphere for belief, for receipt of God's holy and blessed word. Let's give God praise again for the AV team <laughs> who make the connection from here in Plainfield, New Jersey to people all over cyberspace. You see, many of times we have no idea of what goes into just a few minutes of worship. But as you saw, it takes a lot of background work just to keep things moving. Let's give God praise again for the AV team. And for the youth who participated in that wonderful presentation, hats off to you. Amen. Thank you, God, for all of you. Uh, praising God again for the legacy of the First Park Baptist Church. I like that word first, the cardinal number first. That means you're second to no one. First Park Baptist Church. Come on, give God praise for First Park. 200 years. My God. 200 years of existence, and uh, you don't get to be 200 years old being foolish. There's some wisdom that goes along with this band of Christians that guided them over two centuries, and God is still doing great things in the life and lives of his people. Amen. Thank God for you being my first time meeting you, uh, Sister Wilborn. To pray, Bill Wilborn, it's a pleasure to meet you today. I met your husband, but it's also good to meet you too. Lady uh, McClendon, it's good to see you this morning. And to all of our deacons, all of our deacons, all of our great and grand deacons and the ministers and the audience to every one of you, it's good to be in the house of prayer once again. And I'm going to get it in the way. My wife is here with me again, as, as beautiful and lovely as she always is. Thanks be to God for the gift that is my wife. To my father-in-law who is with me today, I love you very much. And for the first time here, my daughter is with me today and my grandson. Who would have thought? A young chap like me with a grandson, right? <laughs> but I thank God for my daughter. She's a burgeoning entrepreneur. She owns a recording studio in Rahway, New Jersey. And God is doing great things in her life. And I'm very, very grateful to God for her. Amen. We're going to jump right into the word of God today. But before we do, we have to recognize that the person whom we honor today is no mythical character. He is not some superhero from the pages of Marvel Comics. He is the most popular person who ever lived. His name, he was born Yeshua ben Joseph, better known to some as Yeshua HaMashiach. <laughs> Try saying that without spitting on the person in front of you. Yeshua HaMashiach also known as Jesus, the Messiah, or the Christos, the anointed one, the chosen one. He is the most popular person who ever lived. In fact, he's the only person who affected the way we measure time. For when you write the date, it doesn't simply mean that time began 2022 years ago, but that would make a very young planet. But the fact of the matter is that time is measured according to the Julian calendar, calendar and it's taking its first beat of the clock, tick of the clock, from the first heartbeat of the little baby born in Bethlehem. So whether you're a Jew, Gentile, atheist, agnostic, Baha'i, Buddhist, Taoist, whatever you are, when you write the date, you are attesting to one thing, that Jesus Christ lives. They should be shouting all over the place. Everyone writes the date and they all attest to the star ledger. Everyone who calculates time, it began with the birth of Jesus Christ in the civilized world. Thanks be to God that we do not, we do not worship a fairy tale. We worship Jesus Christ. He was the most interesting composition of divinity and humanity, which is to say that he was somehow fully God and fully man. One in essence, yet undivided, according to the Nicene Creed, 
He is light from light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended to the dead, and on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. I'm talking about your Jesus. I'm getting excited all by myself. I'm, 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 I'm excited about this. He lives forever. If you will, join me in a reading of scripture. Luke 24, verse number one. And we'll read about eight verses. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Today, we'd like to speak to you from the idea, the after effect, the after effect. Father, we thank you for your word because it's powerful. We pray that you anoint the lips of this, your speaker, your servant, God, that the words would be powerful, the sermon irresistible, and the anointing greater than before. These things we beg in the name of he who died, died and lay down in the grave. And rose on the third day, even our Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God say once again, amen, amen. I am a college professor. I teach at Pillar College in Newark, New Jersey, it's several other campuses, but that's where I'm located. And as a college professor, you have the, the awesome privilege of conveying and mediating truths to different generations of folks. Not everybody comes to school for the right reasons. And so you have to sift through the crowd and make sure that you're meeting folks where they need, uh, meeting them at the point of their need. And while folks are in graduate school, sometimes folks have to be reminded that you're in grad school. Sometimes we can approach these things that we're, we're still in grade school, but no, grad school demands a certain amount of rigor. And I am just the teacher to deliver it, okay? I deliver with rigor. Because my reputation on the, is on the line, the school's reputation is on the line, and then your reputation is on the line. We don't skate you through. We make sure that you earn your degree. So in my journeys, oftentimes I'll meet students. I've met such and one. He will remain nameless. But he railed the entire time during his stay or time at Pillar College. I mean, he railed, this is unfair, professor. I don't, you, five pages? Oh my, God, I should not have to do five pages of, of work, right? Uh, that's too many pages to read. That's too much to be writing. And sometimes we say, well, professor, could you be a little lenient? I know this is not Bible study, this is college. And so sometimes I would be a little lenient, but there would be some times when I just would not relent. And I got some of the worst pounding on this. I happened to be his friend on social media too. So I saw the stuff that he would write about me. Oh, Dr. Rawls is this and Dr. Rawls is that, you know, and being merciful and understanding, I realized that people are entitled to their own opinions. So he, he lambasted me. Oh, I can't understand that. I can't get it. This is torture. This is unreasonable. He laid me out. Come graduation day. Come graduation day, after all the exams were taken, after all of the grades were in, this guy passed with flying colors. All of a sudden, I see someone emerging, right? And say to me, Dr. Rawls, I have to apologize. I said, for what? I was wrong. What do you mean? 
I didn't realize that all that rigor was preparing me to do great things. That it was preparing me for my ascent into a doctoral program because guess what? I made it into another school and I'll be pursuing my doctor. I said, fantastic. And as I walked away from him, I said to myself, what if he realized that all the rigor, all of the stuff he was going through was really going to make out to be a great day or a great experience for him in the aftermath? Oftentimes when we're going through something, the last thing we understand and appreciate is the toil and the labor that we're going through. The challenges that we're subject to, the conflict, the pull, the tension on our lives, we seldom get it while we're going through. I can remember when I was a little kid being in church every Sunday. Now, I was a pastor's kid. And Deacon Wilbon, every Sunday, every, sing, every, every single Sunday, every Saturday, we had kids rehearsal on Saturday all day. I had to be to church for prayer meeting on Wednesday, Bible study on Thursday, Monday, other, uh, other ushers meeting. All week long, I had to be in church. And I said to myself, young folks, when I get grown, I'm never going to church again. No, 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 I'm going to put it in the part. I, I, I ain't never going to church again. But look how things turned out. When you're going through, the last thing you think of is how things are going to work out in the long run. But thanks be to God that he changes our lenses. He allows us to see in hindsight 2020 what we could not see in the middle of the flame. In this text, we're confronted with a scene that captures the bewilderment of three witnesses. Women who were followers of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. Women, first responders, first witnesses to the tomb. And not only a tomb, but an empty tomb. It was the place where Jesus' body was laid to rest, a place where these women expected to find the body of Jesus Christ a place where they expected to find him, but he had risen to their amazement. He rose from the dead and was alive. And in verses four through six, the women were greeted and startled by two strange men who we believe were angelic beings in dazzling apparel, the Bible says, asking them, why are you looking for the living where the dead are located? He, Jesus, is not here. He got up from this place. The men say further in verses 6 and 7, do you remember his words? Do you remember what he said? He said that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, crucified, and then rise from death three days later with the exactness of a formulaic expression like one plus one makes two the angels lay out the process the steps the recipe for resurrection in an unmistakable chronological sequence etched into eternity we see that there is betrayal delivery of christ into the hands of sinful men then there is death and all that is associated with it, the crucifixion and the burial. And then afterwards, 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 the rise, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, like the stretching of a bow, the stretching of a bow causes the powerful and subsequent release of an arrow into the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is the necessary precursor to resurrection, the necessary precursor or antecedent before the arrow is released before Jesus can rise again the crucifixion occurred the words of a popular song say into each life some rain must fall but after the rain new strength you'll gain here is the rhythm of life in Christ that we must all reckon with death and life death in life, like the pulsation of a heart, death and life, like the waves on a seashore, death and life, death and life. There's no escape from this pulsating rhythm, but depending on where you are in the many stanzas of life's song, just know that if you hold on long enough 
and trust God strong enough and live long enough, there will always be an after. I hear the words ringing in my ear. Weeping may endure for the night, but, but, but joy comes in the morning. There will be an after. And I say that to folks who probably endured waves of trouble within the last two years. Losses, incalculable losses, things happening to you in ways, one thing after another. You've endured many hardships. And that's that pulse just reminding you that this is the rhythm of life. How unfair it may seem, how brutal it may seem. It is the rhythm of life to have life and death. Young folks, again, I, I didn't always, always understand why my parents sent me to school. I thought they were the most cruel people in the world sometimes for sending me to school. I thought they were so cruel because they had me ironing bags of clothes on, on the weekend. I ironed not only my clothes, but everybody's clothes. This is no Cinderella story, but it was just me ironing clothes, all right? Why was I down in the, in the basement fixing boilers with my dad and giving my dad my rent money? It was only $50, but it seemed like $50,000, right? Why did I have to give my dad money? Why did I have to clean up the outside, right? I thought they were the most cruel and unusual people on the planet until I had to live on my own. Until I had to take care of my own children. Until I had to prepare meals and do everything for my household as well. Then I finally understood why these things happened to me, but it was only after the preparatory stages of life. Before we can delve into the great and powerful truth of the resurrection and appreciate the magnitude of the event, we must reckon with the reality that made all of this possible. Let's look at what came before. It is the honest heart, the honest person that reckons that this betrayal this crucifixion and burial of Jesus are visible symbols of failure. No one wants to put failure and Jesus in the same sentence because it seems almost blasphemous for us even to suggest for a moment that Jesus could have been perceived by anyone as a failure. He came just a week before, hailed as the king, that he was going to save them now. But he died on a horrible, torturous, criminal-esque cross with very few of the disciples anywhere near him. He seemed like an abject failure. You see, they didn't have the end of the story like you and I do today. They didn't have Bibles that read that this is how it ends. No, they were living it in real time. It seemed like an abject failure for Jesus Christ, an irreversible failure. Jesus chose Judas. He handpicked him himself to be a part of the band of the disciples. But the same Judas betrayed Jesus and turned him over to the officials to be judged and then to be put to death. Jesus selected him. He seemed like a failure. Let me ask, have you ever chosen wrong? Have you ever chosen wrong? I have to be careful, particularly when I ask that question, because you may be sitting next to your choice. I got to be careful. But as a result of this massive betrayal, Jesus was dead. Jesus was buried. After all he promised us, after all the talks and teachings, he's laying here in a tomb, in a grave, wrapped up, sealed up in a tomb. To the disciples, Jesus had failed, dashing and ending their highest hopes and dreams. You see, the crucifixion killed the Jesus they knew, the familiar Christ, the one who healed Peter's mother-in-law. The one who helped Peter pay his taxes by finding some money in the mouth of a fish. The one who healed the blind and the sick and raised a dead woman's son, a woman's dead son to life. The one who gave a prostitute a second chance. 
who fed 5,000 hungry people on a mountainside with five loaves of bread and two fish. Yeah, our Jesus, our boy Jesus, our guy Jesus. Crucifixion killed the dreams and the Christ, the hopes that they screamed about just one week ago on Palm Sunday. Will you restore the kingdom to Israel, Jesus? Will you destroy our enemies and save us now? Which is what the word Hosanna means. Save us now. How many of you have walked with Jesus and talked with him through your service in the church? Through your preaching, teaching, administration, singing, and service, and still the world around you has fallen apart. Was it a failed marriage? Was it the loss of a loved one? The cancer became more aggressive. The tumor is enlarged. The abuser still roams the street. Injustice seems to go unpunished. I haven't found a job yet. The un unemployment benefits have just run out. The social security payments are not enough to sustain me. I've raised my own children and retired, and now I'm taking care of my grandchildren. I had a perfectly laid out plan, but somehow it fell through. I had the money, all the money that I needed, but it slipped through my fingers somehow. Lord, how could this be? I trusted you. I believed in you. But looking at this text, I have to ask, what do you do when there is no way to avoid pain and hurt? What happens when you're on a collision course with fate? with an undesired outcome? What do you do when the way presented to us is not an out, but a through? When there is no way out, but you have to go through. What is our response to these scenarios? When Christ himself was driven to deal with the self same thing, the Christian faith is largely a series of lens changes, if you told the truth. It's a series of changes that occur, occur in our sight. We start out believing God and this life one way, but time, like a sculptor's chisel, chips away at our solid impressions of Jesus. Through his presence in troubled times, he chips away at our fears. Through his keeping power, he assures us that he is able to sustain us. Through his favor, in the presence of our enemies, he makes us to know that a way can be made out of no way. Do I have a witness in the house somewhere? And even sometimes in the midst of what seems like an eerie silence, Christ lets us know that even in the absence of a miracle, he is still there, 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 there in the valley and the shadow of death, there in the cold darkness, there in the shadows, here in the darkness, here in the isolated, lonely realm of shadows and despair, we find Christ laid in a tomb. Christ was buried, wrapped up and buried, prepared for a permanent stay. I say wrapped and anointed with ointment and pungent spices to mask the mephitic odor of decay. His body was never to rise again. It was left alone in a dark space, cold and dismal. Certainly no place for the Son of God to lie in repose. A crypt, a sepulcher, a mausoleum, a tomb, a final place of rest. For many, this is the place where we, like Jesus, are consigned to our final place. Those who doubted us, they've witnessed our failure and our humiliation. Here, figuratively speaking, is where they confirm their suspicions about us. That you and I will never rise again. That we earned our place in the realm of used to be. In, in the realm of has been. Isn't that what a tomb stands for? What used to be? And sometimes people can't get over you being new. And, mm, not, not new, but you are who you used to be. You will always and forever, in their eyes, be relegated to a place of a has-been. A stone was even rolled over the entrance to the tomb. 
ensuring that no one or nothing could get in. And sure enough, nothing could get out. Not even light, darkness. I said darkness where there's no clarity, no contour, no definition, no shape, no sense of height or depth. Everything is undefined in the dark. Have you ever been in a place where it seems like you're going nowhere? Where it seems that you can't even tell night from day because it's always dark inside of your head. Where the beginning or the end makes no sense to you because it all sounds the same. Your, your failure from yesterday just keeps getting tethered to tomorrow. And it becomes an endless story, an endless saga of darkness from day to day to day. An endless night where you seem like you can't get up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been in a depression in your life? Have you ever suffered the effects of loss and failure? Have you ever suffered the blow of a devastating disappointment? But ladies and gentlemen, in so much as darkness is a reality and darkness can be painful, darkness is not always associated with death. You see, there are some places where the darkness, where darkness is the atmosphere for the beginning of life. Somebody say the womb. Come on, say, say the womb. Yeah, yeah, the womb in its darkness for a period in time gestates, cultivates, develops, and springs from it life. Yes, in the darkness of the womb, the darkness, uh, the formation of the hands and feet, the construction of the nervous system, uh, the synaptogenesis begins to fire up there in the chamber of darkness in the womb, yeah, yeah, in the womb, something happens. And something happened in that tomb that day, something that made this tomb different. By the power of the Holy Spirit, this tomb, this sepulcher, this mausoleum, this tomb becomes a womb. This tomb becomes a womb. All right. Yeah, yeah. Early Sunday morning. Jesus got up from the grave. Somebody say early. In my preaching voice, I would say early, but he said early. On a Sunday morning, Jesus got up from the tomb. On Friday, the soldiers and the Jews sealed the tomb and said, never again. But I can imagine Jesus using the words of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator, and said, I'll be back. He got up from the tomb. He came out new from the tomb and became, it, it became a womb, brand new. Somebody say new, brand new with all power. And you all may find yourself in a tomb of sorts. You may be in the worst depression of your life. You may be in the darkest place in your mind. You may be suffering from a loss that cannot be measured by anyone else. You feel alone and forsaken. You may even be wondering, why am I here right now? Is it really over for me? Does it end here in this dark and dismal space? You might have even counted yourself out. Well, I got good news for you. It may be unanticipated, unexpected, and unprecedented, but God can change your dark place into a womb. A womb where the old is made new. A womb that they believe that you would never have. A tomb that you never get out of. Are you listening? A womb where the brand new you has to come forth. A womb where you have to part with even some good things. Where better is even championed by the best. Come on with me. You might have to spend some time in that dark place longer than you expected. And if you haven't, some of you, maybe you will. But after you've suffered for a little while. After you've gone through that dark space, after you suffered your losses, after folks have left you for dead, God will raise you up. God can pick you up and turn you around, set your feet on higher ground. The text says even well-intentioned followers came to look for Jesus in the tomb. Now, some of us believe that that's an honorable thing, but hear me, it shows the lack of belief that he would raise. 
It shows the lack of belief that Jesus would do as he said he would do. And sometimes, people, when we go through things, we forget what God said he would do for us. We forget his example of resurrection power, and we've been to cry and kick. But hear me, as sure as Jesus rose from the dead, you can do. God will raise you up. God will pick you up. God will catapult you into a prosperous future. You see, it's easier for us to classify things. And so when we label someone that fell, it's easy for us. Sister so-and-so is down for the count. Brother so-and-so will never get up again. But you got to look out. You got to look out. You got to watch out because in as little as three days, God has been known to raise folks from the dead. They, they came to look for Jesus in the tomb. But I'm so glad when the real change comes in our lives, there may not be folks who will witness it. But like the Bible says in verses 5 and 6, when folks come looking for the old Jesus, the angel said, why are you looking for living people where you find the dead? That's what I want folks to say. Are you listening to me? When, when they see me, when they look at the old places where I used to run, are you listening to me? Uh, I want them to say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? The things that I used to do, I don't do no more. The places where I used to go, I don't go. And why are you looking for the living, Brian, where he's over at First Park giving God praise amongst the living? Don't look for me among the dead anymore. I'm alive in Jesus Christ. You may not understand it. While you're being betrayed, while you're going through, through your own persecutions and your own struggle, your trials may make no sense at all to you. But I hear from the scriptures that all things work together for the good of them that love God and according to, according to, called according to his purpose. It does not say all good things will work out. It says all things will work out. Even bad things will work out for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Paul says again that the trials of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall, shall, shall be revealed in us. He says again, this light affliction is only for a moment, but it's working something far greater in the future. If you can just hold on. Somebody say after. Somebody say after. After the betrayal. After the persecution. I said after. After they counted you out and left you for dead. There is resurrection in Jesus Christ. I said after. The song says we are often tossed and driven on this restless sea of time. Somber skies and howling tempests all succeed a bright sunshine. But in that land of perfect day, where the mists have rolled away, you may not understand it now, but we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, by and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God will be gathered home, we will tell the story of how we overcome and you, me, and all of us will understand it better by and by. Somebody say, by and by, in the after effect. Can we all stand? You may be going through the test of your life. And many of you may want to throw in the towel now. But if you give up now, the song said, if I turn back now, I won't have no crown. Jesus says, the man who put his hands to the gospel plow looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Keep on pressing on and see what the end is going to be. Your change may be just around the bend. Don't give up. The crucifixion of Jesus brought us eternal life. Had he given up, it would have been over for every one of us. Because he endured the cross, despising the shame, he is now set at the right hand of God the Father. We have a champion in glory who didn't give up. And now we benefit from the after effects of his crucifixion and resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, let the cross of Jesus Christ stand to you as an emblem of perseverance. An emblem of 
indomitable hope in what God can birth through you. He can take your tomb, the place that you were relegated to death, and turn it into a virtual Superman closet, into a womb to rebirth you, reposition you, and resuscitate you. Father, we thank you for your word today, because your word is powerful. We thank you, Almighty God, because your word speaks and never a word falls to the ground. It never returns to your void. So today, God, move on the hearts of the hearers in this room today, that they will hear, be inspired, that they will hear and be born again, that they will turn the chamber, God, of darkness into a place by the Holy Spirit of rebirth and renewal. Thank you for this crowd of folks today, God plant within us the spirit of resurrection, the spirit of bright Sunday, the spirit of the Paschal Lamb whose blood was shed for our sins and endured the cross. Bless them, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. Amen. While you're standing today and while you may be at home, you may not be standing in front of your computer, but you're there. Wherever you are, if you were touched by today's message and it pricked you in your heart and in your mind, you may be in a tomb right now, experiencing death on many levels, maybe natural death of a loved one, maybe the death of a career choice or a wish or a plan, whatever it is, you can turn that around through Jesus Christ. If your heart's been broken, Jesus can fix it. Would you repeat after me, those who want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, would you repeat after me, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you, but I didn't know it. Today I realize that there's no way out of this tomb except by you. My relationships have become a tomb. My own ego has become a tomb. My home has become a tomb. And Lord, I need to be broken out. I heard that your blood, the blood of your son Jesus, cleanses from all sin, breaks the chains of bondage, and sets people free from the dead. Father, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I receive his blood. I receive his sacrifice. And I also receive right now resurrection power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for my new life in Jesus Christ. I won't just live to see another day, but God, I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Father, I give to you the rest of my life, not as a payment, but as a postscript, saying, Lord, I love you, and for the rest of my life, I will serve you in resurrection power. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer with me, you're on the road to resurrection. You're on the road to revival. And God is about to do some amazing things for you. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. Is my prayer. Find a good Bible study. Get in it. And be nourished and cultivated and developed in the faith. May the Lord God bless you real good. Is my prayer. Did you enjoy this great man of God today? The way maker, I'm so happy y'all clap because next week will be part two. Yes. He, he will be with us that next week. If you don't mind, Pastor, would you have an altar prayer and then benediction by all means? All of you who want to come to altar prayer. If you're ever thirsty, you can keep coming to the altar as often as you like. If someone has a need for prayer, you're, you're going towards the Lord right now. Make your way to the altar. We will pray for you. The Bible God, says the prayer of faith will save the sick. You may be sick in your body or in your mind or in your heart. Make your way to the altar and we'll pray with light and for in you. The darkness, in Jesus name. My God, that is who you are. You're the brave one today. God, you are.
Jesus says, Suffer the Lord's children to come to me. And don't forbid them because of such is the kingdom of light in the darkness. Come on, babes. My Be the brave one. Show the so the Lord for anybody can come. Who you anybody are. can come. If you're hungry enough. God, you are if you're needy enough, you'll go in the fire. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness, these little my children God, before you, in a flash, are going to be a you are. In a flash. They are starting early, understanding that this is the key Way to victory. It's found in the altar. It's found in the presence of the saints. It's found in prayer. In Can y'all reach your hands toward them and just pray for the children today? Who you that God will bless and keep them and hold them God, you are as they navigate through these crazy schools and all of the craziness that's going on in the school systems, we have to pray hedges of protection around them. Father God, we come today in the name of Jesus Christ with these beautiful children, this beautiful heritage from the Lord, these, the offspring of the church. God, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their upbringing, God. They're here in yes, the service Lord. of the Lord today. We thank you for these babies. And even as the Jesus grew in the fear and admonition of the Lord and in favor with God and man, we pray also, God, that you would grow these babies in favor, that you would soak them in favor, conspicuous favor, God, that when they walk in front of the enemy, God, there is something peculiar about them, something powerful about them, something about them that opens doors that are closed in front of them, that goes past the obstacles set in their path. God, give them that kind of bounce back, that kind of resurrection power to bounce back, that resilience, God, that will find them unable to be stopped. Whatever they may be facing, God, image issues, peer pressure, self-hatred, whatever it is, I pray in the mighty matchless name of Jesus the Christ that you would surround them, engulf them, God, in your love, in your hope, in faith, that they would live and not die, but declare the works of the Lord in this age. This we pray. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. amen. Come on, give the Lord praise for their future, their amen. prosperous future in Jesus Christ. Amen. And while you're standing, here's, here's an here's a Easter egg. After every Marvel movie, there's an Easter egg, right? Next Sunday's message is entitled The After Effect, the after Part effect. 2. <laughs> now may grace, mercy, and truth the love of God our Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. Let it rest, rule, and abide with us all now and forever. And the people of God said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Go in peace. Let the church say amen. Let the church Say amen. God has spoken. So, so let, let the church say amen. 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 God has spoken. God has spoken. So let the church. So let the church say amen. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.